So I'm so pleased to have Becky Masterman with us this morning. She's with the University of Minnesota Bee Lab. Uh, they're on the St. Paul campus. She's the associate director of the Bee Squad and actually first started working with the Bee Lab there in 1992 as an undergraduate. Uh, then came back after her PhD working with honeybees and uh, rejoined the lab in 2012. So today Becky's going to talk about mite check using beekeeper citizen science to transmit bee health information, not varroa destructor. So Becky, I'll turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to everybody who um, has joined us this morning. Um, I wish I could see your smiling faces, but since I can't, I'll just imagine that you're very engaged and happy uh, to talk about mites for an hour. Um, so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey and include some history because of the fact that we didn't just get to the point where we thought, hey, let's just start a beekeeper citizen science project and, and see what's going on. It really happened because of the fact that we are so confused about uh, varroa mites and what they're doing to our colonies. And we figured out that there's a lot we don't know and that engaging beekeepers in helping us find some answers was a, a great next step to learning more about varroa mites. So with that, Ooh, with that, I'd like to tell you that we've been looking for mites uh, at the University of Minnesota for many, many years. A um, little bit of history. The University of Minnesota Bee Lab has been around since the early 1900s. I like to think that they were looking for mites here, but um, we do know that Varroa didn't come until 1987, and this fashion doesn't quite ma match with 1987 fashion. Um, we do have a new bee lab here, and hopefully some of you will get to visit it at, at some time. Um, we're hoping to do uh, really good work here, but just imagine um, that I am right now in that room, that bright room on the right. That's where I'm giving this talk, so just imagine that you're there with me. I run the Bee Squad, which was defined to be an outreach organization for both beekeepers and for the public. And that's important because a lot of what we've learned about mites is due to the public participation in some of our Bee Squad programming. So we're here because of the fact that since 2006, bees, honeybees have been dying in unprecedented numbers. And um, both the public and beekeepers want to be part of the solution. So the Bee Squad was formed by Dr. Marla Spivak to uh, meet that need. Right now, the Bee Squad is uh, a really, uh, it's an amazing organization. We have over 20 individuals, and it is, uh, for the most part, their job. We do have undergraduates now who are part of the, the program, but Bee Squad started with people um, who, who made it their point to have this be their profession, which is kind of interesting for an outreach organization at a university. Um, undergraduates did recently join the group. I've got a, a picture of them here. I'm there for scale because uh, Christian on the left in the bee uniform, um, you can see he's actually our bee veteran who joined the program and allowed us to capture this image. But um, we, our undergraduates make a big important uh, contribution to our project here. And bee squad is a very diverse uh, program with a lot of different avenues. I mentioned that we're trying to help beekeepers, but we're also trying to engage the public in different ways to help bees. Our Hive to Bottle program, I'm going to mention it a lot today because it is a project in the Twin Cities area where we manage colonies in about a 35 mile radius. And what we do with these colonies is we're able to collect data and we're able to identify some really important bee health trends. Now this project is, has grown since I joined the program in late 2012. And it's important to note that it's the public, it's either uh, families in their backyards or it's corporations. Um, on the right you'll see 3M's colony and on the left that's uh, a apiary we manage on the rooftop of Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And we manage these colonies, so we are the beekeepers. And when we are doing the management, we're able to collect colony data every time we visit. And through this program, that is uh, part of where we've seen some very interesting information reveal itself um, as far as varroa infestations. We've also identified some queen issues. Uh, we've seen a lot of supersedure in these colonies over time. Not so much last year, but in previous years. And we're also able to see how resources vary across the Twin Cities greater metro area. And also seen um, some issues about robbing um, that 
can make a difference when it comes to mite horizontal transmission. So I mentioned a little bit ago that with the history of Varroa, it was first detected in the United States in 1987. And at that time, there was just one approved uh, synthetic miticide treatment for Varroa. And a lot has changed. But since 2006, we've started um, to see really high losses with honeybees. And originally, it was it, they were recorded as wintering losses. And many of you have probably seen this graph already. But it's just important to uh, point out that the high losses started in 2006, um, and luckily the Bee Informed Partnership uh, was put together and they started collecting these really important data. But in 2010, 2011, um, they started adding summer losses. And as many of you beekeepers probably know, um, it's not, not just losing your bees in the winter. Sometimes your bees aren't healthy enough to make it to the winter to die. Um, they die before that. And uh, the last couple of years, we've seen uh, uh, fairly high summer losses. So we don't know what this, this year looks like, um, but unfortunately, it's always something that it's, um, <clears throat> we don't think it's reversed itself yet. So today, um, a lot different than 1987, Varroa are widespread. <clears throat> Excuse me, we see them in all colonies. Um, we don't think there's an area out there um, except for maybe on an island in the United States where the colonies don't have Varroa. And the good news is that there are multiple approved, excuse me, synthetic and organic miticides for Varroa control. This makes a really big difference. This uh, having different um, avenues of control makes uh, your job as a beekeeper, if you do have a really high infestation, it makes it a little bit easier um, and we have uh, ways where we can avoid resistance to these miticides. Um, many beekeepers don't recognize um, the signs of colony death by Varroa though, and I think that a day doesn't go by where we don't get an email or a Facebook post or a phone call where a beekeeper describes colony death to us and wonders what could have happened, and um, when we, we hear their description, we tell them that really does sound like it was Varroa. Um, the, the most common characteristics are that your colony dies with a lot of honey on the colony, so it did not die of starvation, and you still have a lot of honey left in the hive, but you do not have bees. And so you have honey, no bees, and you also um, very often can look into the colony and see perforated cells and some chewed out pupae. And if you look very closely, you can see um, varroa, um, varroa feces in the cells. And the, that description sometimes because of the perforated cells confuses people and they might think that their colony died because of AFB. But um, instead it's, it's very li likely to be Varroa and um, often you can see um, mites on the bottom board. But it's important that beekeepers learn to be able to tell what uh, colony death by Varroa looks like. And part of that goes back to um, being able to monitor to know if you potentially had a problem with Varroa in the first place. So the monitoring methods that are out there are varied. Um, we've got uh, alcohol washes, we've got powdered sugar roll, we've got sticky boards, and um, some people are looking in drone comb, some people are looking just on the bees themselves to see if they see Varroa. But so right now, we're trying to make a difference as far as trying to have one language to talk about your varroa levels. And um, we're, we're, we've chosen to use the powdered sugar roll test. But uh, right now, they are varied. And so we're all speaking different varroa languages as far as what our infestations are. Now, excuse me, the evidence suggests that how you manage your varroa <clears throat> It, your burrow infestation now actually can impact your, your beekeeper neighbors. And so much like AFB, American Fall Brood was an issue in the past. Um, we don't see it a lot in Minnesota at all, but um, it's a very contagious disease and your management um, actually impacted your neighbors because it was um, able to be spread across uh, miles. Um, we're, we're now seeing some evidence that uh, varroa infestations are the same. So it's really important that we all understand what our varroa infestations mean now because it's not just our colonies that we're impacting, but um, very likely our neighbor's colonies. 
So just to wrap up the negative, sad portion of, of this talk, um, our honeybees are facing so many different issues. And this is a slide um, that I, I used from Dr. Spivak at the Bee Lab. But it, it does state a couple of different things that are very important that I'd like to point out. Um, we do know that multiple issues are facing our honeybees. We know that we have environmental issues. We have insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, just pesticides in general um, are, are impacting our, our bees. We know that we have a lot less bee food out there, and that's a big issue from our own colonies that we manage. We see that nutrition is so important. If we have really healthy bees, they can, um, with with often with our intervention, they can push through a uh, deformed wing virus, mite infestation, um, different issues, and, and make it through the other side. But if they are um, lacking at all in nutrition, that's really difficult for the bees to be able to fight some of these different issues. Varroa, it's, it's made it in to red at this point because we really do feel like at this point there's a varroa epidemic. It's a, a public health crisis for honeybees, and um, and that is because of the fact that the varroa is no longer just a problem because it's an ectoparasite feeding on the bees, but it's a vector now, and it's a vector that's uh, able to transmit some uh, pretty virulent pathogens. So I just want to refer you to, um, we're in the north, so we're in northern climates, but if you are um, at all interested, our honeybee diseases and pest manual is available for free as a PDF on our website. And at the end of this webinar, I will also uh, direct you to another resource as far as um, mite information, disease and pest information. Um, but this one is on our website, available for you to download um, and have access. And I think it's also important that in this manual that you um, see that where we're coming from, we don't want to put anything into our colonies. Um, 30, 30 years ago, it was very common to put um, antibiotics prophylactically in the colony. It was um, common to use fumagillin for nosema. And um, at this point, our philosophy here at the University of Minnesota is that we, we, we don't want to put something into the colony. Um, sometimes we feel like we, we don't have a choice. But when we do are faced with that choice, um, we've chosen to use organic miticides. So we don't want the contamination of the beeswax or hive products. And we also don't want to participate in resistance to antibiotics and pesticides. And um, also, the, the studies have shown that a lot of residue can get into beeswax, and that's just something we don't want to happen, and so um, we're trying to prevent that uh, as much as possible. So with that said, unfortunately, sometimes we have problems. Um, hopefully you've never seen this in your colony. I mentioned our hide to bottle uh, program <clears throat> where people are, um, are they're amazing in letting us manage their bees and allowing us to see when health trends pop up. And even though we're pretty aggressive as far as monitoring and um, managing our mites, we actually saw more uh, deformed wing virus last year than we'd seen in previous years. And um, this was one of those trends that we don't like to see. So despite our our actual um, efforts to be as aggressive as possible using organic miticides and management, um, we're, we're still seeing things like deformed wing virus and parasitic mite syndrome. And this is the reality, this is from 2014-15, but the total annual loss by state um, from uh, as far as honeybee colonies. This is again a bee informed partnership survey. So, uh, and just another um, a shout out actually to the bee informed partnership I, I strongly encourage you to participate in this survey. These data are really important. It's important for us to have an idea of what's going on across the country as far as uh, colony loss. And so there is an annual survey. And so I do, do strongly encourage you to go there and participate um, after um, April 1 when, if your bees survived winter, it's, it's April 1 is considered the cutoff date for that survival. So I told you I was going to go through a little bit of history just to let you know how we got to this point of, of getting my check up and running. Uh, 2013 was our my first year for running the Hive to Bottle program, and we had just shy of 50 colonies. 
And at that point in our U of M beekeeping class, uh, we the the recommendation actually was the you start your colony with a package, and the package bees you don't have a varroa problem, and so you don't even need to monitor or manage varroa your first year. So the official recommendation was. Um, don't even worry about it. And so if you're about to sign up on this webinar, just know that that recommendation changes dramatically um, because of what we've seen in the program. So don't just take that as a recommendation. This is history now. Um, but we found very few mites in our mentoring apiary program where we were doing hands-on beekeeping instruction. And um, our, our treatment thresholds for varroa management for year two, year three beekeepers were actually quite high. And in 2014, we had about double the colonies we had in 2013. And, um, but we did start monitoring for mites frequently um, in the colonies. Um, we found, again, very few mite col mites in our mentoring apiary program until after September 1st. And so in where we are, the recommendations were to um, look for the mites uh, late August. And so it turns out that when we kept looking for them, that's when we were seeing our, our fall spikes. And um, so basically we saw colonies that looked just fine, but when we kept tracking them, they started deteriorating. And they also had an associated mite level that was quite high. Excuse me. And then in our program, we had a lot of backyard beekeepers that they, they told us they were not monitoring for mites. And, um, and so um, we um, realized that we, we started to see these issues with mites. We saw that maybe our timing for recommendations for monitoring and then intervening were our timing could be off. And we also had some friends out there that had um, other questions about what's going on with these mites and um, problems with, with managing them. And uh, University of Maryland and Michigan State um, have joined us in this um, adventure to um, try to figure out what's going on with the mites. And uh, we put together, actually a, a farmer beekeeper on my team um, put together this testing kit for us. And this testing kit was just, the, it was, um, the powdered sugar roll was developed at University of Nebraska. And um, so it, it, we did not develop it, but we actually put it into a format where people could buy it. And in the manual that I um, recommended to you that you can download for free, there are step-by-step -step instructions on putting it together yourself. And if you do it yourself, it's only going to cost you a few dollars. But what we found were that, was that beekeepers were not putting them together and wanted to have that kit in one place so that they could just buy it and then have it as part of their equipment. And so in order to be a participant in my check, we do request that it's a powdered sugar roll test that you do, but we do not require that you have to buy our kit. So this isn't a multi-level marketing scheme. Um, we're just uh, looking to try to make it easy to get access to be able to test, and but putting it together, uh, beekeepers are so good at being able to do that, but there was a group that um, they were not putting their kits together, and so we're trying to make that easy. And then the other project that we started working with um, the University of Maryland and Michigan State with and be informed partnership was Mite Check. And with that, we're trying to get um, the beekeepers to come together to share their, their varroa mite data. So I mentioned that we're using the powdered sugar roll tests, and this is what our kit looks like. And um, again, uh, your kit can um, look um, anything, anything like that. Our instructions are now online. Um, we do have um, the, the rule for putting 300 bees, which is the standard um, sample size for a powdered sugar roll, is that it's 0.42 cups, but it's also um, 100 milliliters. And so that might be an easier way to measure it. And we hope that you don't find this, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately, it's, it's more common to find this. And in our Hive to Bottle program, what we've been seeing is that we're seeing uh, the high numbers like um, you see in this bucket, we're seeing it in unpredictable times. So it's not just that we're seeing them late fall, but sometimes we'll see something like this happen in June. And so that's one of our, our big questions is how is this happening? How could we be monitoring? and in the monitoring, we see low levels, and then all of a sudden, we see something like this, which is a pretty serious infestation. And um, 
part of that, um, and, and we know that the powdered sugar test is actually reliable, and it can give you very, very good data if it's done correctly. And so the fact that we're seeing levels spike um, made us question what exactly was going on. And so, um, but we, we are um, fans of this test, uh, mostly because it's reliable and it's non-destructive. So it's a good way to look at what those, um, what the mite levels are um, of the mites that are riding around on the bees, the phoretic mites. And the sticky boards, a lot of people like sticky because you're not, you don't have to go into the colony. But our, the, the reason we haven't selected sticky boards as our standard test is because it, it's really hard to measure a spiking mite population in a sticky board um, test as fast as you can do it in a powdered sugar roll test. Uh, in 2015, now, um, this is about the third year that I've been managing the Hive to Bottle program and our mentoring APA program. Um, this was a real game changer because we found in two packaged colonies that we started on foundation um, in April, we found a 25 to 30% mite infestation in these colonies. And these colonies were beautiful colonies that produce surplus honey. We have a three deep management system in, at the University of Minnesota um, that we use. And so these colonies not only had about 100 surplus pounds of honey for the winter, but they had also produced some surplus honey. And they had huge populations. They looked gorgeous. But from what I had learned, um, once we found those, those um, high mite populations, what we ended up doing is we treated them with um, formic acid, mine away quick strips. But we found those high mite populations, and I told the owner, because this was in our have to bottle program, I said, I know that these bees look beautiful and they look so healthy, but from what we have heard, what we've um, observed is that when you have such high levels and um, in the colony, that, that there's a really good chance that the colony isn't going to survive. And um, I looked smart, which I didn't want to do, but I, uh, come September, those bees had left. Even though we did intervene with the mito, uh, a treatment, those bees had disappeared from the colony, and that colony was full of honey, um, and it had brood that it was partially uncapped, some shoot out pupae, and uh, again, this was a couple of years ago that um, we, we basically witnessed um, the fact that we had this strong colony tons of surplus honey, that um, great population that was reduced to um, no bees and lots of honey. And so um, the, from this season, we learned there were unpredictable spikes found when we were monitoring the mites. And we started to just believe that, you know, we all need to track our mite populations because if this can happen in these packaged colonies, then um, what else is going on that we just don't know because um, not all beekeepers are looking at their, their mite populations. And uh, then we started to, to um, investigate and, and learn and talk about the horizontal transmission between colonies. And so we know that drones can move mites back and forth between colonies, but then we were looking um, and, and talking about are there other ways that more mites are getting into these colonies? It's because this apiary had just two um, it had two colonies in the apiary, so it wasn't a really big apiary where uh, we could explain um, necessarily that we've got um, mites um, going in through horizontal transmission from drones because basically we had two colonies on um, foundation that uh, the mites uh, went up to very, very high levels and we couldn't explain it just by normal mite reproduction in the um, colonies. So. Uh, we we became more focused on monitoring and varroa control, and um, a lot of this is because we figured that there's this horizontal transmission of varroa destructor going on, and so uh, this was supported by a, a paper that's um, it's a good read. It's uh, it was research done in Germany about the autumn invasion rates of varroa destructor in the honeybee colonies um, and the resulting. Uh, increase in mite populations. And here they, they were controlling mite populations within the colony and so basically observing in their apiaries the fact that mites were getting in and it wasn't due to reproduction in the colonies. And um, this paper, it 
it's really important work because it it started it gave a um, scientific basis to what we were what we were feeling was happening. And so, um, in 2016, um, last year, our heptabottle mentoring apiary program had grown significantly. So we were managing a lot of colonies and um, able to really get a good idea of. of um, some of the mite issues we were experiencing um, through monthly monitoring. And so we, we started and, and basically our goal was to look at every uh, colony and do monthly monitoring and seeing if we are seeing some um, spiking mite levels throughout the season. And uh, from that, this is just a, a small change, but we think beekeepers really need to track their mite populations because um, it's really it's it's really devastating when you lose a colony and um, and it's happening more and more in the summer. And we think that if beekeepers are or monitoring their mite levels, they can at least maybe get a clue as far as some of these colony losses. And it's also the season redefined how we were viewing varroa and apiary management due to horizontal transmission. Just the fact that um, in our area, we have a lot of honeybee colonies that are managed, um, not just by us, but throughout the, the, the state of Minnesota. And so we realized that in you know, dense areas where there are a lot of different beekeepers and a lot of different colonies that um, you're, you're more susceptible to um, varroa and horizontal transmission. So we, we've um, kind of made it our goal. Um, um, we're we're anti-varroa, I'll say it, um, just because of the fact that it's, it's a vector and it's uh, really a serious uh, threat to honeybee colonies. And so we're trying to encourage uh, beekeepers to at least see if you have that or, or see how your populations change over time. And um, so we're, we're uh, trying to find creative ways to encourage beekeepers to go ahead and, and uh, look at their varroa populations. And this, this sums up a lot here. The, our, our mite varroa destructor um, has, has changed over the 30 years that it's been in the U.S. And I mentioned it earlier, but it's the, we know varroa um, was a parasite that eventually could kill a colony within a couple of years. Um, but it, it will reduce the lifespan of your bees, it compromises your immune system, and it can lead to that colony collapse um, in late fall, early winter. But Varroa as a vector, so Varroa that it's vectoring these viruses, it um, also compromises immune systems and makes your bees more susceptible to other diseases and potentially pesticides. And, and it can lead to colony collapse any time of the year. And so the game changer is that Varroa has become a vector. So like a mosquito vectors uh, different pathogens, our Varroa are vectoring pathogens. And we don't know how to treat the bees for these diseases. And because of the fact that we have colonies coming in constantly into the population, we, um, we have a hard time um, finding a, a way to model not treating your colonies and letting your, your bees become resistant. The, the varroa mite is not, um, it's not a, a native pest to our honeybee. It, it transferred over from the Asian honeybee. And so our honeybees have um, very, they don't have high defenses against uh, this mite. And unlike in the Asian honeybee, where varroa just uh, re will reproduce in drum brood, and so it'll keep the, the varroa levels down, our varroa are reproducing in worker brood. So um, for, from our understanding at this point now, uh, how we're managing our populations of varroa can impact the honeybee colonies in your area. And honeybee colonies that are collapsing from mite infestation can be a source of mites that are transferring to healthy colonies. And we know this because of um, horizontal transmission studies. And uh, we initially were thinking that it was uh, just a robbing scenario. But now um, some studies are being done and some pilot data show that a colony collapsing from Varroa, those bees can be found in apiaries um, within a couple of miles of the collapsing colony. And it's pilot data done at the University of Maryland, so it's not a study that's been published yet, but it certainly has our attention, and there still are a lot of questions to ask about what that actually means.
But in the meantime, um, if we, th we think that if the beekeepers are allowing your colonies to have a lot of mites, um, then the sick bees with mites and viruses can abandon the colony and enter other colonies. And so if you're in an area that is densely populated with bees and beekeepers, um, your problem can become your neighbor's problem. So the good news is, is that if you have a varroa problem, it's officially not your fault, it's your neighbor's fault. Um, but uh, seriously, it is a, it's a good idea uh, to have a conversation with beekeepers in your area, just to talk about maybe getting together and monitoring and, um, and getting together and just talking about different strategies to keep the varroa uh, levels lower. And so, we're redefining area, uh, apiary. Um, this is a, an area photo, an old, old photo of the Twin Cities metro area, but um, this is um, now kind of what we think of as an apiary. So there are studies that show that you know if, if your your bees in your apiary have a, a problem, a mite problem, you need to go ahead and manage all the colonies in the apiary um, to protect them. And um, unfortunately, we're at the point in areas like Minneapolis where we have a lot of backyard beekeepers. Um, we're really interested in you know, how we can um, address this, this varroa transmission problem. And now is a good time to say that if you are in an area where you do not have bees around you, then that is great. And you get to take a very different approach to managing your mites than if you're in an area where you're close by to other beekeepers. So uh, now we talk about Mite Check, which is our beekeeper citizen science project. And we have a couple of different goals. Um, how can we um, get beekeepers to become really good at mite monitoring? So it's a little daunting, especially if you're a newer beekeeper, to um, get bees off of the comb and to put them in a jar and to shake them up and, um, and to um, actually get the mites off of them and count them. And so we're, we're encouraging beekeepers to start early in the season when their colonies are not as big and um, get comfortable with it over time. And I promise you that it, it might not be comfortable the first couple of times, but it gets really easy and it gets to be something that, um, especially that first time when you are shaking those, those bees and your bees look really healthy and you're maybe questioning why am I even bothering because you don't see the mites um, and you start shaking and all of a sudden your container is just peppered with those little oval brownish um, reddish mites and you are like whoa I, I had no idea and um, with that then you become you, you understand why maybe it is important to start um, monitoring regularly because we can't tell with our naked eye those mites are um, based on uh, PhD research done by Sam Ramsey that um, hasn't been published yet, but I believe it's in the process of being submitted. Those mites are feeding on the ventral portion of your, your bees. They're hiding in the segments of the bees, so you can't see them if you're just looking at the frame. If you see them on the thorax, you are, are seeing them in transit, but you can't see them actually feeding on, on your bees because they feed on the, basically the belly of the bee. Um, so my tech, um, we're asking beekeepers to get good at it. Um, we're also trying to figure out a way where beekeepers can share information about mite levels in their area. And so that might um, give you a heads up that, hey, there are high mites, so I, I need to make sure that my colony is, is um, still at a, a good level of mites. Um, I don't know if there's a good level, but an acceptable level. Um, and also having um, helping us understand our, our early fall mite populations. So we're, we're still a little confused about it, and, and we do think that horizontal transmission is playing a really big role in it. Um, but uh, sharing data is a great way to um, get at that. And so in our mite check survey, we're asking beekeepers to test for mites monthly during management season. Now in Minnesota, it's a little different because we used to maybe test the end of August, early September, and we um, have now been testing into October. We've had weather in the 50s where we can do that. And we're seeing that even though we intervened with the uh, management um, for, for mites because they were higher, we're seeing uh, levels spike up again um, in October. And so we're asking 
beekeepers to test and then report their results and then they can go ahead and they can uh, view mite levels from across the country and locally. And right now we're doing this at a county level and um, county, obviously, you're going to have apiaries in the county that are, are too far away to impact your colonies. We are trying to keep it anonymous and so that we're um, not trying to pinpoint anybody out and say, okay, this is where the mite problem is. Um, so we're trying to keep it anonymous. We are keeping it anonymous. We're not just trying. Um, but county level is working for that. Um, right now, this is a, a picture of, this is, these are all the data collected last year from Mite Check. It was our first year. And um, this is a compiled data um, for the year of, of, ma of monitoring for the season. And we had about 34, 35 states participate, which is really exciting. And I know that um, all of you smart people out there are saying that all we need to do is to get Minnesotans and Michigan uh, it's to stop keeping bees, and then our mite problem is going to be totally solved. But I will tell you, um, the Michigan and the Minnesota data points are a result of both the bee squad working in Minnesota and our, our beekeepers, um, and same thing, the um, Megan Milbreth at MSU working in Michigan to really encourage beekeepers to get out. And we've got great, great beekeepers in our states that are willing to um, go ahead and test and report. So we're not the cause of it, we're just sharing our data first. Um, but it's really exciting to get some, some people across the country. And the whole goal of this is that the map will show you one month's data. And if you look right now on the, the, the website, you can see we actually have two counties reporting in Minnesota and one just reported in Texas. And so the, um, the whole goal is for you to be able to go to the map and you can actually search, um, you put in the survey results and search a date range. So you search a date range and you can see what the results look like. But the whole goal is for beekeepers to go and say, okay, what, is the, what does the country look like right now as far as mite levels? And, um, and so we're hoping for a lot more data points this year to give us uh, a lot of uh, more information. And also it is just reporting right now the highest report, uh, level reported per um, county. So what we've agreed um, as far as talking about what this actually means, what these data mean, um, and this is, this is general, and we refer to your local experts for, for uh, more detailed information. But zero to three mites, uh, it's a relatively low mite level per 100 bees. Keep monitoring and managing. Um, we, we do recommend uh, at two to three mites in the fall in Minnesota uh, managing your populations. But um, you have a lot of different ways to manage the mites, splitting, drone trapping, brood breaks, um, screen bottom boards. Um, four to five, um, an intervention will increase your chances of uh, colony survival, so that's a use of a miticide. And six to 10 per 100, colony loss or damage likely intervention is critical um, in order to prevent the colony loss. And um, at 11 plus, um, with nothing done, the colony um, is likely to be lost and intervention will help decrease the threat of horizontal transmission of the mites to neighboring colonies. Uh, here's just a little bit of what it looks like in the reports, and this is accessible. You can look at the site and take a look at it. So this is just compiled from last year, um, the reports of mites per 100 bees, all uh, the way from zero, that's what we like to hear, although up to 11 plus, and, um, and then what actions were taken after sampling. And, um, and you see a little bit of, of management as far as breaking the brood cycle and drunk home uh, removal. Obviously, that's the preferred way, and, and that's what we're really interested in at the University of Minnesota in our bee squad program. We would prefer that we could actually manage the bees differently so that we don't have to intervene with the miticide. And so we're asking some questions about um, different management styles, and um, I don't have anything to report right now, but also looking at just different bee genetics. So I, I do say that when we're managing colonies, we are also sometimes managing them the same exact way we would try to get the highest mite population possible. So um, really big brood nests um, and, um, and bees that, that don't maybe slow down based upon what the weather is like um, are, 
are maybe contributing to the, some of our, our mite levels, and so we're really cognizant of that, and we, we don't want to have to intervene with a chemical, but we've also um, realized that we don't want our bees to suffer. Um, we're recommending that you're testing for mites monthly from spring until late fall, and um, we we're, we're really believe strongly that your consistent monitoring will enable the beekeepers to address spiking mite populations. So again, I will say that there's a lot we don't know. Um, sometimes if you see a really high uh, mite infestation, uh, we think that if it's a relatively new infestation uh, based upon a horizontal transmission incident, that you can get in there and knock the mites down and save your bees. And, but if we don't think that if you let it go, um, there's a high likelihood of those bees being able to um, withstand the, that pressure. And again, it's not the mites as much as it's the pathogens that they're transmitting. And so um, also we're looking for beekeepers to check on those, those bees to see if they're having these um, late summer, fall mite population spikes, which is expected because your brood nest is shrinking. But um, again, it's something that people might check their bees, not see high levels, and then think all is good. And it, the truth is that all those mites are hiding in the comb. So, um, so for monitoring um, the varroa, um, it's, it's important um, from our recommendations to go ahead and test those mite levels, manage the mites based upon the test results. And then you test your mite levels after management to make sure that whatever you tried to do to lower your mite levels uh, was effective. And so you have a couple of different things in play. You've got the fact that you used um, some kind of management strategy to lower your mites. And then what we really don't understand is what this horizontal transmission, what it looks like, how many bees are bringing mites back, how fast it can happen. Um, so there are a lot of unanswered questions. And um, that's the, the kind of the need to get everybody on board. Because if we're all looking at this uh, and all the questions, hopefully we're going to get to a point where we can get some good answers and, and give everybody good uh, recommendations. There are a lot of things you can do uh, for rural management. I, I mentioned them earlier, um, some of them earlier. Um, divides, drone brood removal, brood interruption, requeening with different genetic lines. Best thing you can do is get an island. Um, if you can get an island, um, you are good to go. And keep your bees um, somewhere in an isolated area. Um, also, uh, mitozides are, are an important intervention um, sometimes to save a colony. And it's our last resort. Um, but uh, again, we're using the organic mitozides, so we feel a little bit better about what's being left in the um, calm. Another resource that has been uh, put together for you for uh, mite control um, and giving you a lot of detailed information is uh, the Honeybee Health Coalition. And so I gave you this website, and this is a coalition of a lot of different uh, groups that are interested in bee health. And um, they've worked really hard. I, I know a lot of people who are working on this project, and they've worked really hard to put together very comprehensive information. And so, um, this is, I think, I think it's the one place where you're going to get the most information about all the different potential ways to control mites and the efficacy and timing and temperature. Uh, mite control, we believe it's really important, but it's also really local. And so, so hopefully you have good resources in your area to help you um, choose the best way to intervene um, as far as managing the mites. So I'll bring it back to this uh, slide. And um, it's really, again, right now we feel like we're, we're in a, a little bit of a crisis. And um, hopefully you're hearing me. My most important message is that if we monitor Varroa, we're going to learn a lot about it. I, I absolutely understand and I respect that not everybody has the same feelings about um, miticide. Some people might um, really embrace synthetic miticides. Some people uh, do not want any kind of a miticide in their colony. And, and um, I, I, I respect that on, on both levels and or both decisions. But um, and I'm just sharing what we've, we've decided we're going to do. Regardless of where you are in how you're um, managing for Varroa, we're hoping that you'll become a partner and um, actually um, 
at least monitor and then um, think about sharing that information with Might Check. Uh, we have some really great people on that project and um, we're currently looking for funding to be able to even expand the, the capability as far as data analysis and um, different projects that we can do. But the key point is um, here, and, and we should always think about this as um, something very important, is the fact that nutrition can help our bees uh, with um, a lot of the different issues that they face, and there, it's also so important to our native bees out there. So the one thing that you can do <clears throat> is to encourage everyone to plant food for bees, and um, that's going to make a big difference. And so if everybody goes back and they look at their, their um, their sphere and they say, hey, you know what, um, my, my church can't help me fight mites, but they directly, but indirectly, if they put more flowers in the yard, in the grounds for the bees, it's going to make a difference. So that's what I suggest you do. Um, just like to acknowledge that the Bee Squad has been supported by a lot of different um, organizations and, um, and groups. Um, and um, just like to mention the fact that our, our Hive to Bottle customers uh, that's our customer generated revenue the fact that they're able to support us in this um, adventure as far as trying to figure out what's going on with the bees um, has, is really important and if you uh, want to get in touch with us um, you have a lot of different options as far as um, finding us and thank you very much for listening great thanks becky thanks for a great webinar um, as you were talking, I know you mentioned that the data that's collected through Mite Check is anonymous. I wonder if you could just emphasize that a little bit. I know beekeepers often are, you know, kind of protective of where their apiary is or, um, you know, revealing their strategies for, um, say, pest management or um, hive management to other beekeepers. So could you just talk about that again? Um, we, we actually opted to not even have customer accounts. And so... Um, you're, when you're logging in, you're just you're putting in your information, um, and it is the the most revealing data you have that's being asked is about um, the uh, county that you live in, and so and then when you're reporting the information as far as what kind of, of intervention you have, um, that information again is just being uh, aggregated and reported, and it's it's more informational at this point. And so again, this is a new project that we started last year, and we actually have started we started it without official funding. We do get some funds from the sale of the mic kits, but in no way would they support all of the different teams we have working on this. And so um, it's a very very general concept right now as far as just getting people to start sharing information so that we can um, learn about what kind of levels are out there and also what people are doing to intervene but it's no way um, tied back to the person who are um, the people who are actually um, doing the um, the reporting you're not going to get a knock on your door and say hey can we go to your apiary we see you have a problem <laughs> Great. Uh, someone asked how, why not treating for Varroa is not an option. It's really interesting because we are, if you are in an area where you do not have any colonies around you and you don't have new immigration of colonies around you, then you're really lucky and you have that option to go ahead. Um, I only had... Um, 45 minutes to an hour here, and so we couldn't talk about all, all the different things going on, but we know that um, there, there's evidence out there that there's a virus associated um, with um, colony loss, um, deformed wing virus, and we know that there are different strains of this virus, and so if we um, are looking at a system, an epidemiological model, which I am not an epidemiologist, so um, we have to be careful about what I'm saying. But um, the way I understand it is we're looking at a system that's closed. We can get um, select for basically not the varroa, but you're selecting for the viruses that um, are not as deadly and, and are not deadly. And so your bees can, again, go back to 1987, where they can actually withstand a lot of varroa, and it won't kill them. Um, and at th that point, if you change your management strategies, you can have a really good um, option as far as not having to do any kind of management. Um, what we know now is that with a lot of the ways we're keeping bees in close proximity to other beekeepers and a lot of people um, bringing in basically new mite populations, that we don't have um, a closed system where we can just select for resistant bees. And
And it gets to the point where um, the the fact that we can't protect these bees because of more bees coming into the system is um, to the point where our, our bees are, um, if you've seen a colony um, in, in the middle of a collapse, um, it's, a lot of us have made the choice that that's just not, that we, we, we treat bees as livestock and we want to make sure that we're treating them humanely and not um, watching them get sick and not intervene. Okay, great. There are a couple of questions related to, um, if you could just give a kind of an overview of how the bee squad manages for Varroa, some of your different strategies. Sure, sure. So we've actually, for most of our colonies, our management, um, our management strategy uh, for, if we're using a miticide, we are using formic acid, so we're using mitoway quick strips, and then we're also using oxalic acid, and we do a dribble uh, late in the season, so in about October here, and we, we try to get the colonies to be broodless um, at that point. And so I've, I've mentioned earlier that uh, we, we strongly believe that actual management is, is really important and maybe there are some shifts that we can make. And so we're looking at finding bees. Um, historically, we managed a lot of Italian colonies here with really, really big brood nests. And we also um, have done divides. When our, our colonies were quite big, so they might have um, 8 to 12 frames of brood. And so we're recognizing that we might not be getting a really effective um, the 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 impact of a divide, we might be waiting too late to have that happen because the colonies are already so big. I've talked to some commercial beekeepers who manage a lot of colonies and um, they say that, that, you know, they think that if a colony has four frames of brood and they're not ahead of varroa management that it's, it's almost too late. And so we've really been looking at our own practices and trying to ask the questions of what can we do differently so that we can reduce miticide use and, um, and keep the bees healthier. Um, but that the same um, time, we're recognizing that in our area, when we have horizontal transmission, a, an incident where lots of mites are coming to the colony, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to address that without using a miticide, um, um, because it, depending upon when it happens. There was a question about the impact of migratory beekeeping and how that affects varroa concentrations and strategies for management. Yeah, so that's interesting. So the the bee and farm partnership survey data they t they tell you a lot, and the, um, the I mean obviously if we kept all of our bees in one place, um, and we didn't have um, bees within two miles of our apiaries, that would be the best way to to uh, uh, to really address varroa and to go ahead and to. Um, to not have a problem, but we do have migratory beekeeping. Um, I will tell you that the Bee Informed Partnership data survey really do show that commercial beekeepers are better at keeping their bees alive than backyard beekeepers. Um, a lot of it, I think, is because they're professional. Um, you know, this is their livelihood, and um, they're really aggressive with varroa management, which they have to be because they're bringing their bees to areas where a lot of different bees are coming together. Um, this is the first year, I believe, in the Bee Informed Partnership survey where um, Beekeeper, the commercial beekeepers have been reporting that their losses are, um, if they ask how they're, they're, um, how they're, be they're losing their bees, the survey data is the best way we can get this information. And the commercial beekeepers have been saying for a long time it's varroa driven. Um, and this is the first year actually that commercial, that backyard beekeepers are, are saying that now. And we, we attribute that to some of the awareness of what it looks like when, when colonies are dying from varroa. Um, and so, so um, migratory beekeeping, again, it's been going on for, you know, over 100 years in this, this um, country. And so um, I, don't, I don't point at that as being the issue. Um, I, I point at this, this mite coming into play, and we're, we haven't been able to manage it effectively. Um, that's, that's kind of my summary of, of what I think of uh, what's going on with the migratory colonies. Um, so, Becky, the other question was, um, a couple questions actually, related to brood cycle interruption, if you could talk about that and kind of what you're doing with the queen during that, how that works. Mm -hmm. um, so, so brood break is, um, it, it's, it's a really good thing to think about, right? Um, so, we, 
Okay, my official answer is that except for the divides, um, it, which would provide us a really a small brood break, uh, we, I don't have um, anything that's data driven from our program to report to you. Now, I hope that that will change in a year because um, we, we're looking at our divides, doing them much earlier this year, and also um, having a time where we can have more of a brood break. And so there are people out there who are absolutely amazing and who know a lot more than I do as far as brood breaks. And um, so I'm going to have to um, defer to... Um, them. I'm, I'm guessing that Randy Oliver is, has something that's going to help people about effectiveness of brood breaks. Um, I can't give you good data. Right now, again, we're, it's confounded in the area where we keep bees because of the fact that we have um, what I think is a horizontal transmission epidemic crisis. And so I when I talk to beekeepers I always have to, you know, take a step back and go, okay, they're not they're not all in the area that we're in and so it's not necessarily you're not going to have that pressure. And so um I, it's harder for us to look at brood breaks because of the pressure we have from mites. And um so I am going to refer people to um Again, other experts and then local local organizations. And the other thing um, that I, I strongly suggest is that if you get together with a group of beekeepers and you try to go ahead and monitor um, brood break and, and um, monitor again, um, if you get together with a group, it's a little bit easier to actually do the science. And um, also what we've been talking about as far as the queens, we um, just... Um, just decided this year that any any queen that overwinters based upon what we have been seeing in the past is that we're going to be requeening um, any any survivor queen um, because we saw them fail at various times throughout the summer and we've seen a lot of, of um, issues with um, queen longevity and um, having a new queen in there can make a difference. Now what we tried to do with that we gave us the longest brood break um, was to do walk away divides and I can't say from our data that it was good enough and so um, I think it's really important that you, you um, look at it yourself because our walk away divides weren't as successful. So you look at it yourself in your area because depending upon your resources you might have um, much better success. So that was a really long answer and thank you for holding with me but um, I, don't want, I don't want to um, say that they're not extremely effective because there are beekeepers out there who are doing an amazing job just with brood breaks and one of the ways to have an extended brood break is to do a walk away divide but that can also result in a um, in queens being maybe not as good as if they're they're grafted from one day old larvae and so um, there are a lot of different things to think about.